Welcome to Bet On It NFL Edition. It is week three. We are filming September 18th, 2024. As we do every single Wednesday here on the Wager Talk YouTube channel. We've got some different segments for you guys. We've revamped, we've listened because you guys tell us what you want and you dictate the show. So we're going to go over the primetime games. We've got VR for some gold. We've got Teddy's just the tip. Maybe a sandwich spot. Are you high? And of course, a barking dog. We're going to keep prop shop with Andy Lang and special new segment with Ralph for some TNA. And of course, following up with those best bets. Let's bring them on in. Marco D'Angelo, Joe Ranieri, Teddy Covers, wagertalk.com to get in for these Thursday night games. We got two on Monday. And of course, in between, we've got Sunday night, Kansas City at Atlanta. But Marco, I'm going to go with you first. A, a game that looks like I might just have to go with them in Survivor. New England, now a six-point underdog at the New York Jets. Total 38 and a half. Historically, the Jets have been absolutely owned by this team. Is it time for that finally to switch? Well, Kelly, we're going to do what we did last week here in this segment. And I'm going to tell you, last week we went with uh, the home favorite. We teased them. Or no, we teased Buffalo up last week, uh, got them over the number. They covered the front end, and we teased with the Giants. And I do read comments, got a lot of comments on me taking the Giants last week but we were playing numbers. We got it over the touchdown because quite frankly, Washington should not be laying a margin in my opinion. And it was a snooze fest of a game and an easy cover. What I'm gonna do this week is give you a play similar to last week, but we're also going to give you a little education. Uh, the Jets, we know what's happening here. They're coming home. It's their first home game uh, Thursday night, their prime time game. So naturally Aaron Rodgers, in prime time, you know, we're paying a little bit of a tax if you want to take them. The uh, better, the bookmakers know where the money's going to come in this game. Uh, the Jets are going to be the popular side. I really don't want to lay the six points with them in this game. So we got a couple options. Do we go with a teaser or do we go with a money line parlay? And this is where the education comes in for you. Uh, you could tease this one. And the team that I'm teasing it with, you could tease them down to pick or in look at Cleveland at home to just win against that team we just talked about, the Giants, uh, you'd get them minus a half. But if you do the math, it's better to do a money line parlay with these two. You'll actually bring back a little bit more. The best number that most people can get for a six-point teaser is minus 120. Here in Vegas, uh, 125 is very common. Uh, so if you look at it, you're laying 120 or 125 to win hundred dollars where if you put these two on a money line parlay have the jets just win this game and have cleveland just win at home on sunday we're actually bringing back 103 so we're getting better for a bang, bigger bang for your buck not much but kelly as you know those add up over the course of the season those three dollars five dollars here or there so for this one i like the jets to win this one in Aaron Rodgers' debut at home, they got the win last week, and this offense is going to get better by the week as he shakes the rust off, and they continue to get that chemistry going with him and his receivers. We know what kind of defense both teams have, but the big difference in this game is the two offenses. New England doesn't have one. The Jets is improving by the week. Take the Jets and Cleveland in a money line parlay. Woo. Thursday to Sunday. Whew. Interesting, Marco. Uh, lots of injuries there on the New England side of the ball, so keep an eye on those injury reports heading into tomorrow evening. Sunday night, Kansas City down to three and a half at Atlanta. Teddy, you were on Atlanta on Monday night. Do we think this line's fallen a little too far, maybe an overreaction on a short week? So from a side standpoint, this is a really hard game for me. I can make pretty good cases against both of these two teams this week. Look, make no mistake about it. Chiefs offense is not clicking on all cylinders. They were one of eight on third downs last week. They had four point yards, 4.8 yards per play in that ball game. Turned the ball over three times. Mahomes only 151 passing yards. They got bailed out with a fourth down pass interference penalty uh, on the final game winning drive. But we're not talking about a Chiefs offense right now that's clicking on all cylinders. We're really not. 
It's the same story with Atlanta. And oh, by the way, great quote from Patrick Mahomes talking about this being a potential flat spot for Atlanta. Quote, that's two, or for Kansas City, I say at Atlanta. Quote, that's two great football games we played the last two weeks. Teams we played in the AFC Championship game. Uh, we'll be a better team for it. But certainly, KC back to back, down to the wire finishes against quality foes who in games they cared about. Now they're on the highway against a non conference foe. It's not a let's lay points with Kansas City spot. That being said, I'm not convinced Atlanta's good enough. They're not. <laughs> they haven't shown me the first two weeks of the season that this offense is ready to click either. And certainly, when you look at all the big names that Atlanta has, well, they're not getting the football. Their leading receiver right now is Daryl Mooney. Their second leading receiver is Ray J. Ray Ray McLeod. So uh, it's not the, uh, the all these top ten draft choices suddenly lighting up the scoreboard. So I don't know that I want Atlanta. I don't know why Kansas City. What I do want here is the total. Chiefs have been an under team. All right, they were eleven five and one to the under last year. All right, and certainly two and zero to the over this year. So we're not seeing that early bandwagon for KC unders, but Falcons offensive line isn't playing well. KC has the pass rush to stop them. Kirk Cousins is not in midseason rhythm. Atlanta's not throwing downfield. Kansas City's not throwing downfield, and the Falcons defense has certainly lived up to or exceeded expectations early. Put it all together, 46 and a half. That's too high for this better. Under on Sunday night football. An under, and uh, as I've stated every single week, I'm done betting against Kansas City, even though it would have worked out for me last week. And sometimes you just got to, you know, we, we talked about this before the show. I'm going to interject. Let's bring all four guys back in. We joked about this, probably because we're not going to hit this game, so I want to bring it up. We joked before the show, sometimes you just got to not be that stubborn. And I said, the guys that keep betting the Panthers every single week, which they're doing again this week, I don't understand. It reminds me of the years the wise guys would bet against New England every single week, and they'd bet on the Browns. And at one point in time, I was smart enough not to do that, Marco D'Angelo. I hope that I'm finally going to learn from uh, two weeks in a row betting the Panthers. You going to do the same? Why are you co- why are you calling me out, Kelly? <laughs> I didn't, I'm calling you out yeah, because Marco is 8-2 and two in the Westgate Super Contest and his two losses, the Carolina Panthers. And because we're not going to talk about that game probably today, eh, we'll see. One game we are going to talk about, the doubleheader. Uh, Joe and I are going to break down here Monday night. Jacksonville is, let me get the Wager Talk odd screen open, a five-point favorite. Oh, excuse me, a five-point underdog at Buffalo. Total, 45 and a half. This one is really interesting. We've got a Buffalo team off an extended break, right? If you guys remember last Thursday, they were in Miami. So now they have all the way till Monday. And all of a sudden, you've got the Jacksonville Jaguars sitting at 0-2 after they just paid Trevor Lawrence a lot of money. Now, if we take a step back and we look at those two losses, they were combined by eight points to two teams that essentially are playoff contenders, if you will. We're going to see how this one ends up playing out uh, because I bet against this Jacksonville team last year and by all accounts got really lucky. I'm just not sure this is a team I want to back with my hard-earned money right now. Two for 14 on third down were the Browns last week, and they had 100 penalty yards, and they still beat Jacksonville. This is not a Jacksonville team that is well-rounded. This is not a Jacksonville team that, again, I'm ready to back with my hard-earned money. Now, the flip side looks very, very easy to just bet Buffalo. The five is just sitting there saying, come on in, guys. The water's warm because the Jags have not really been that impressive, but they have historically given the Bills all they can handle. If you remember last year, these two met up and uh, it did not end well for the Bills. Long story short, I'm not going to bet this team or neither either one of these teams. I'm going to do a Teddy kind of move here. I'm going to look towards the under. I expect to see a ton of running. If you guys remember, James Cook had three touchdowns last week versus the Dolphins. We want Trevor Lawrence to make less mistakes Historically, he has not been great in September, uh, and I think we continue to see that into this one. Look for this one to be like a 24-14 final. Give me the under here in Buffalo, under 45 and a half. 
Joe Ranieri, the late Monday night game, the Washington football commanders, seven and a half at Cincinnati, total 47. Yeah, well, let's, uh, here we go, right? Once again with the Bengals, uh, Cal, 0-2 to start the year. Way to go, uh, Zach Taylor and Joe Burrow. What is this, the fifth time now in, uh, in the last six seasons we've had to deal scratching our head this time of year going, what in the hell is wrong with the Bengals? Well, the answer is probably we won't be having that same conversation uh, after this uh, set last game of the doubleheader of Monday night. Two Monday night games that are going to be on at the same exact time. That's interesting. Scheduling NFL. Uh, the bottom line to me is here we go. Rookie quarterback uh, on a Monday night. We've seen that. Just saw that uh, in a primetime game with Caleb Williams. Uh, listen, for all the faults that Cincinnati has had, uh, including not having T. Higgins uh, on the field. We'll see if that ever comes to fruition where maybe he actually plays in this game. Uh, but the Bengals defense starting to put it together here, which is great. The Washington defense, not great. Joe Burrow should have won that game last week against the Kansas City Chiefs. He looks uh, less and less rusty. Looks like he's figured out the whole wrist injury here. Uh, to me, this is a game in which Joe Burrow and Cincinnati, uh, they get it done right. Nobody has been more profitable off a loss, especially back-to-back -back losses, like Mr. Burrow here. They can't drop to 0 and 3. Don't see that happening. Burrow 15, 6 and 1 against the number. After a straight up loss, uh, Washington going back to the last year, the defense, they might have gotten a defensive head coach. The defense ain't any better. They're allowing uh, 30 plus per game since last season here. I do think the Bengals get right. I think they get the running game going, which has been a big problem here. Washington uh, defensively can't stop the run. I mean, hell, even Danny Dimes lit up that secondary through the air there as uh, neighbors ended up having himself a day. I think this is right for big time blowout. I think it's seven and a half somewhere in that ballpark there. Would not shock me at all that the Bengals win this game by double digits on the late half of the Monday night slate. Total's a little high for a teaser spot for me there, Joe, but I might be putting them in some of my splash entries because I'm not going all in on your New York Jets. <clears throat> Appreciate you, Marco, Joe, and Teddy for your contributions in the prime time. We're going to switch it on over because I mentioned to start the show, we're mixing it up here on Bet On It. It's time to go see with the guy, the little leprechaun. Where's he at? The little gold bucket? You know what I mean. VR is in for some of that NFL gold. There's the man with a Phillies baseball hat on, even though it's football season, and a 76er shirt on. VR, you never <laughs> cease to amaze me. You're here every single week, and of course, on Last Call, Saturdays and Sundays with me as well, giving us that late reporting gold. It's Wednesday morning there on the West Coast. What have you got for us so far? Yeah, some good stuff already, Kelly, but you want to keep your eye on resistance. My goal is to share as much actionable information, hoping that you already handicapped your matchups, you know who you like, and maybe I can help confirm some of those positions. And always keep your eye out for resistance later in the week because these NFL lines are so tight, you are seeing a lot of groups that are just disagreeing based on the line movement. Let's start off with the Thursday night game. New uh, York Jets took some minus six money went to six and a half i thought we were going to see seven but once again you saw a little resistance come in on the patriot side and that's why this one's still sitting around that six six and a half but i could assure you that the jets definitely took some sharp money earlier in the week in fact some respected wise guy money earlier in the week and many thought they got lucky last week we'll see how that turns out and then the bears on sunday on the money line and plus the points. Let's not forget the look ahead here was two and a half and 47. Look, uh, I think they put up one and a half and 43 and a half. Obviously, injuries on the defensive side of the ball for the Colts. Uh, but the Bears, remember, they're coming off two tough games where they played a lot better defenses in Houston and Tennessee than they're facing here against the Colts. And I think that's why you're seeing that Bears money, not just plus the points, but then on the money line as well. Interested to see if that total gets hit, because that's a huge adjustment, four points down from that 47. Texans on the road against the Vikings, minus one and a half, minus two. Don't be surprised 
any threes out there if you saw sharp guys pick up the three on Minnesota, one of those teams that you're starting to see get upgraded in power ratings. Move down to the Eagles. Big adjustment here. The look ahead had the Philadelphia Eagles minus three and a half. So if there's not recency bias at this on this number, there's no such thing. But they're coming off a bad beat. You got to couple that as well. And the Saints have looked as phenomenal as you can. Not only have they won and covered back-to-back games, but they put up 40-plus points in those. You got to adjust your power ratings, but how high? I think it's an over-adjustment. You're seeing Eagles money come in there. Then a total. This is the look-ahead was on the Broncos and Buccaneers was 43. That's when you saw some under money, but when it got to 39, that's when the real move came in, over 39. A lot of injuries on the defensive side of the ball for the Buccaneers. And you know Denver's coming off back-to-back tough games. Seattle, Pittsburgh should be a little bit easier against Buccaneers. So this looked like one of those setups. Get that under moving down under that 40 and blast the shit out of it when it does. Because I I think I I bet it three different times off screen. Um, Titans, minus one and a half, minus two, minus two and a half. I'm a little bit surprised. I guess you're thinking Willis will regress, you know, coming off 12 of 14 completions, one touchdown, no interceptions. Dolphins, plus six and a half. We know Tua's on IR. The look ahead was minus one and a half. Seahawks now went to six and a half. I think that it's a little over adjustment on the drop off from the starter to the backup. Lions Cardinals over 51, 51 and a half. Drop down to the Sunday night game. Falcons, wise guys love them. Steamed them on Monday night football. Came right back and steamed them on Sunday night football. Nothing for Monday night yet. That's what's going on early in NFL. Make sure you check out Last Call. No better show than that as far as up to the minute actionable information. Sundays, I love doing that with you, Kel. Thanks for having me on. Always, we love that late steam at Greek underscore gambler on all your social channels. Thank you to VR, and we will see you next week. It's time to see if we're going to eat some sandwiches. If anybody's high, just the tip with Teddy. And of course, I'm going to bring you guys a very sizable barking dog. But we're going to start with Marco. Marco, is the deli back open? The deli's back open, Kelly, and the deli was uh, in full service last week. And guys, I just want to acknowledge all of our viewers that made the comments in uh, YouTube channel. We do read them, or at least I do read them. And uh, I want to thank everybody for their support of my Minnesota sandwich last week. You guys did not like that sandwich, and that's fine. I love the comments, and I love you doing it before the game. Don't be one of those guys that come in after a play loses and throw shade, throw it at the beginning. But you know what? You know, I refrained from coming back saying, where are you at now? Because none of you guys came back in the comment section after the game. Uh, But uh, NFL has been good, guys. Let's continue to roll. And I've got another sandwich, going to be a little bit ugly again, but we're going to do it, and here's why. We're actually going to the Monday night game. Kelly just talked about Jacksonville and Buffalo. I am going to get involved in this game, and I'm doing it because of the sandwich spot. Now, I know it's a Monday night football game, and you're going to say, how could you even try to tell us that Buffalo's in a sandwich spot here? Well, they're coming off a primetime game last week. It was the Thursday night game. It was against the Miami Dolphins. It was against the division rival. It was a team that everybody figured was going to battle Buffalo for the division along with the Jets this year. And they not only won that game, they had a total beatdown of the Dolphins. Now, granted, Uh, Tua got hurt in that game, but the game was already decided when he got hurt. It wasn't a situation that that's why Miami lost. Now Buffalo has got the extra time prep. Everybody's going to look at that as a huge advantage. I look at it as just extra days for them to read the press clippings and feel all good about themselves, fat and sassy after that big win. And who do they got on deck? They got Baltimore. Granted, Baltimore's 0-2, but... Jacksonville's 0-2 and and Baltimore's 0-2. Who do you think scares them more of a team they're going to have to be reckoned with later in the season? Yeah, it's Baltimore at 0-2. That's a big game next week. And as far as Jacksonville goes, this line is telling you a red flag, big one. And Kelly alluded to it. 
It's sitting at five. Five is that number that's just begging you to come in. You know, it's, yeah, it's over the field goal, but it's under that touchdown and it's under that six in case they get the touchdown and miss the extra point. It's so easy. No, we're not going that way. We're taking the sandwich. If you got to hold your nose while you eat it, I don't care. We had to do that last week. You guys laughed at Minnesota. You can laugh at Jacksonville again here. Tell me about it in the comment section if you agree or disagree before the game. I'm going Jacksonville plus the points and maybe just a little sprinkle on Monday night because I'll throw something else out there. How many Monday night money line parlays will there be because there's a double this week? Buffalo in um, Cincinnati. They'll be they'll, they'll have the tickets pre-printed when you talk to John Murray this week, uh, Kelly. You know one of those is going down. They're not going to let both money line parlay favorites come home on a Monday night. They got to help the books out. Oh boy, Marco may have just single-handedly convinced me to take Jacksonville after I said I wasn't taking a side because I didn't trust this offense. Uh, nice sandwich spot, though. That was something I did not consider when I looked at that Monday night game. Kudos to Marco. You guys. Maybe don't tell me he's an idiot in the comment section this week, or do. Uh, Joe, how high are you this week? We got that under on Monday night. Thank you for that one. But this week looks like it's not high enough. No, it's not. We're going back to that now, too, and all, uh, Cal, when it comes to uh, being high on this show. Uh, we'll try to make it 3-0 and here, Cal, as we are going to go to the game that nobody uh, wants to bet here, except me. I'll bet it. Uh, the Carolina Panthers taking on the Raiders. Now, it's important to know that once we learned that uh, Bryce Young was not going to be the quarterback here, we did see this total right around 38, 37 and a half. It has gotten bet up. It's hovering around the 44 and a half, uh, 40 and a half mark. And I still don't think uh, that it's, uh, it's going to be high enough here. Uh, to me, this is an overplay simply for a couple of reasons. Carolina Panthers go with the uh, the Red Rocket here or the Red Rifle or, I don't know, Andy Dalton's uh, bordering uh, AARP at this point. Doesn't matter. He is not going to be worse than what we just got from Bryce Young. When you look at how bad Bryce Young is, now keep in mind, Dave Canales, the head coach of the Carolina Panthers, was brought in and hired to do what? Uh, to fix Bryce Young, and yet here we are in the third game of the season, and Dave Canales goes to ownership and David Tepper and tells him, he's got to go. Like, I've got to get him out of here. And you've got to ask yourself, well, why? Because you just put your offense under a microscope now, because what happens if it's the offense sucks and it's no better with Andy Dalton? Well, then your job is on the line because David Tepper is not a guy, the owner of Carolina, as we all know, uh, not to pull the trigger and fire a guy after one year. So there has to be something going on in that building where Canales feels that it is just so bad that his best chance to showcase his offense is with Andy Dalton under center and not Bryce Young. And I can tell you, look at the level of competition here, guys, that they've had to go up against. When it comes to Carolina just played the number four and six defense against the run. They're now taking on the 25th ranked defense against the run with the Raiders. They also played the number one and number six defense versus the pass. Guess what? They're taking on the number 18th ranked defense against the pass and the Raiders not to mention the number one and number three defenses in the red zone. Now they get the number 22 red zone defense with the Raiders. It looked totally inept with Young and as much blame as he deserves. The reality is you don't make this move as a first year head coach who was brought in to fix a guy and then go and tell ownership, he's got to go. We got to get him out of here. Uh, he thinks this is going to be a much better offense with Andy Dalton. And I agree. I think it's going to be a much better offensive performance here against the Raiders. I do think we finally saw Devontae Adams, uh, Brock Bowers, the tight end for the Raiders. A lot of weapons there. I think there's going to be a lot of scoring. I don't like either defense. But I do think as long as Andy Dalton and that offense can get us to 17, 20 points, somewhere in that ballpark. I think we'll have plenty to get up and over. I got it 28 to 20 in that ballpark, Cal. So this total is not high enough for me this week. 
not high enough. Let's go see what Teddy's got for just the tip last week. Mm. He told us that he was buying the Bucks this week. He's selling the Saints. Yeah, I mean, this is sports betting 101, guys. Uh, I mean, it really is. The Saints have looked like the best team in the world through the first two weeks of the season. Of course, week one came against Carolina. Week two came against a very vulnerable Dallas defense. But all the numbers show, the statistical profile right now has New Orleans as the best team ever. You know, they're uh, number one in the NFL in yards per play uh, game. They're number four in the NFL in yards per allowed. They uh, forced, they're number two in the league in four turnovers. Everything's great for New Orleans. And oh, look, this week they get to face a banged up Philly team that's coming off a crushing Monday night loss and is in a bad scheduling spot. And maybe they win again this week. Maybe. All that being said, when you talk about a team that was, again, seven and a half win team lined coming into the season, coming off back to back 40 point games to open the campaign. Yes, I've upgraded New Orleans in my power ratings, but no, I have not upgraded New Orleans in my power ratings where there were three-point favors against Philly <laughs> just yet. The markets, and especially considering one of the two came against Carolina and the other came against a Dallas team that we had all kinds of defensive question marks about in a spot where the Cowboys didn't come to play. So we're not going to say New Orleans stinks. That said, I haven't given up my under seven and a half wins for the Saints. I haven't given up on my Dennis Allen to be the first head coach fired. <laughs> you know, I haven't given up on any of that stuff yet because New Orleans hasn't done anything yet. The markets think they have. Look who they have coming up. All right. They have Philly this week, play a potential playoff team. Atlanta, division favorite. At Kansas City, division favorite. At Tampa. Uh, you know, the next four weeks, not easy for New Orleans. I expect them to come back to earth in a hurry. Kel? Mm. Ooh, come back to earth in a hurry, Teddy. I may be on your buy team here for the best bet segment. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to let you guys know here in a little bit. This one's mm. going to be tough. This is uh, an interesting dog. I had a tough time finding dogs after basically every single dog cash last week. And because I'm not like Marco, I want a big dog. Four and a half last week. We got the CLV trophy with the Titans. And um, as I mentioned, Will Levis, he just, you know, he, he just can't stop out throwing interceptions. This week, I'm not sure the Rams can actually win this game outright. We know they're without their two biggest offensive weapons in Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua, and that is not great. And we're keeping an eye on this offensive line. But let's not talk about the 49ers. They don't have... Christian McCaffrey, they don't have Debo Samuel. So it's not like their offense is super explosive still. Uh, if you look at the look ahead line for this game, prior to Cup and Samuel's injuries, it was four. Now it's seven and a half. I think that is very telling because why? Oh, wait, the Rams just got their doors blown off by who? Ah, oh, the Arizona Cardinals. I think LA being a Home divisional dog here is going to keep this one within a touchdown. I know Kyle Shanahan is probably going to get the nod as the better coach because he's done really well, 9-2, and two, straight up in the last 11 meetings. But I do think that 7.5 with this total, 43.5, also lean towards the under, meaning points are at a premium. Give me the 7.5 here with the Rams. Maybe they can keep it close. Maybe they can win by a last-minute field goal. So that is my barking dog for this week. We're going to kick it on over. We're going to go to Prop Shop with Andy Lang. There's the guy formerly known as the Prop Prince, Andy Lang. Uh, we're going to come up with a new nickname. So if you guys have one, drop it in the chat. Andy Lang, how has your prop... <laughs> what is with those eyeballs? You know, you know, <laughs> when you still use the term Prop Prince, that doesn't mean we've gotten rid of it. Like when you still refer to no, it, you're still referring to me. As, yeah, as, because we, as as the prop prints. We need a new one. And so we're going to let our audience pick, just like we let them pick Teddy's no. just the tip, because they're all a bunch of perverts. I've, 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 seen the, I've seen the comment section. I will not be taking suggestions from the audience about my new nickname. That is, you're just, you're part of the No Fun League. This is what we're in. You, you handicapped the No Fun League, and now you're a very big part of it. All right, let's get into your prop bet. NFL week three. How have you been doing so far in the prop market? Um, we hit our two best bets here on this show. We hit our 4% uh, 
best bet last Thursday, and then uh, we gave it back on Sunday with some small plays. So that was really frustrating. Um, but let's see if we can make it three and zero here on bet on it. And we are going to look to DeAndre Swift of the Chicago Bears. We will take him over fifty two and a half yards rushing. Kelly, right before we rec- we recorded, I said. Do you know how many yards the Colts are giving up on the ground per game? Do you want to guess? Do you want to just take a wild guess? Uh, two games? 370. So they've given up 474 <laughs> yards on the ground in two games. They are giving up 237 yards on the ground through two games. Uh, both Josh Jacobs and Joe Mixon got 30 plus rush attempts, uh, well over 150 yards for them. And we are getting the starting running back of the Chicago Bears at only 52 and a half. And Kelly, the Colts just put DeForest Buckner on IR. He was the only run stuffer that they've had. Now, we're getting a really low number on DeAndre Swift. Just listen, his stats have not looked good. And the Bears offense has not looked good. But what a perfect time for the Bears to commit to the run. You're playing the worst rush defense in the NFL. You're coming off a game where Caleb Williams barely survived with his life because they couldn't pick up a blitz to save their life. If they want to protect Caleb Williams, there's two ways you can do it. Really improve your blocking or run, run, run the ball. I think they're going to run the ball a ton. And here's the nice thing about DeAndre Swift. He only has 24 carries for 48 yards. Putrid. They've played two pretty good rush defenses. And the nice thing, he's the only running back getting carries. He has 24 carries. Uh, Travis Homer is the other running back. He only has three carries. Khalil Herbert only has four carries. So if they're going to have a run-heavy attack, which I think would be a very smart idea, I'm guessing DeAndre Swift is going to be the bell cow and get a majority of the carries. This Colts defense against the rush is an absolute fade for the rest of the season. The Washington secondary and the Colts rush defense, those are absolute fades. So I will happily take DeAndre Swift over 52 and a half this week. Well, as long as the Bears don't win for my season win total under eight and a half, he is Andy Lang at Bump Sports on X, at Andy Lang Bets on TikTok and Instagram. Make sure you guys are headed over there to see what he's got. And of course, I've got these glasses on because it's time to tell the guy formerly known as the Prop Prince goodbye and hello to the Stat Daddy. Ralph Michaels, TNA, we have listened to the YouTube analytics and we've listened to you. So we've kind of revamped the show as well as the segment. Ralph is going to bring us all the actionable info with a play for you guys each and every week here on the NFL edition of Bet on It. If you guys want some charts for all you nerds out there like me, you're going to have to go to his Twitter at CalSportsLV. Thank you, Kelly. And I am going, you know, we talked about it off the show, how the dogs have progressed. And I'm going with another dog this week, Green Bay plus the points. Make sure you shop. There was two and a half. It got to pretty much three across the board. And now it's split between two and a half and three. So make sure you get that full field goal. Granted, the Green Bay situation, we don't know who the quarterback is going to be. Obviously, I'd love to have Jordan Love back. If not, I'm okay with Malik Willis. The way the running attack has happened, you know, if after two weeks you're averaging 212 yards per game and 5.7 yards per carry, I don't care who you played. They actually played Philadelphia and Indy and were able to run with that kind of success with Jacobs. If it's Willis, what did Willis do last week? Well, the team ran for 260 yards, so he was an amazing 12 of 14. And he's got a little bit of a... uh, a bug up his uh, a bug up his butt going back to Tennessee and and playing against the Titans. So I'm fine with either quarterback in that role. You look at Tennessee, 244 yards against Chicago, 17 points, 17 points against the Jets. They've been sacked seven times. Levis with a 5.3 yards per attempt. I've never seen a number that low in the NFL after two weeks. And then we look at some situations. You may say. Oh, Tennessee is desperate because they're 0-2 and they're a home favorite? Well, guess what? The last three years, 0-2 teams that have been a home favorite have gone 0-4-1. That's 0% ATS. And since 2016, they have only cashed 25% against the time. So they're 0-2 for a reason. Don't be afraid to fade them. When you look at non-division teams with one team off a win and a cover, like Green Bay, against a team off a loss and failed to cover, those teams that covered the first game, 
64% against the spread since 2018. You look at teams like Green Bay that are a non-division dog off a win in a low-scoring game where they scored 17 points or less. Those teams have gone 76.3% against the spread. Again, another fine situation. And coaching edges, I give a huge coaching edge to Green Bay. To me, when you have the better coach, it really sticks out in two areas. Early in the season, when you're preparing your team, and when you're the underdog, you know how to cover and keep the game close. LaFleur as a dog, 23 and 11 against the spread, and no one in the NFL has been better during the first four games of the season. LaFleur is 16 and 6 ATS in that role. There's only one other coach since 2019 that has a win percentage over 64% the first month of the season. FYI, that's the Buffalo Bills at 71.4%. Add it up, it is the fate of Tennessee, it is the ground game of Green Bay, and the Packers get it done with yet another upset this week. As somebody who has been personally victimized by Will Levis for the last two weeks, I do not blame anybody for wanting to fade him. I guess I should have asked Andy about the interception prop there on how much juice we should be willing to lay. Thank you to Ralph Michaels. He is always the best. As I mentioned, if you guys are missing his charts, Cal Sports LV over on X. Now we're going to bring back the guys because it's time for some best bets. All right, time for best bets. Marco, Joe, and Teddy, and then I will bat clean up. Marco D'Angelo has been red hot in the NFL. So, Marco, you get to go first. Give me uh, your best bet for NFL Week 3, and then also let me know what you have to promote over at wagertalk.com. Well, Kelly, let's start there. We got a special offer for the Bet On It viewers this week. Seven days for $77. Use coupon code MD77. Now, we've got a 5% play going this week uh, over at Wager Talk. We had one last week. Guys, I don't release a lot of them. Going all the way back to February, we've only had 11 of them. We've won nine of the 11. Our 5% major wager last week was the Cincinnati Bengals plus the points. Almost got that outright win, but we'll take the cover with the Bengals. And we've got another big play going this week. So head over to wagertalk.com, get this special, just Buy the seven-day package. When you check out, use coupon code MD77. Kelly, we are going to go back to the scene of the crime from last week. We had the big sandwich play on the Minnesota Vikings, and for all the reasons that I liked the Vikings last week, going against them this week. And this is a spot where I am looking at them. I like to refer to last week's game. You know, we alluded to it when we broke the game down that it was a bad spot for the 49ers. It was also a spot for Minnesota where I like to refer to it as it was their statement game. It was their legitimizer. Both teams entered that game at 1-0, and but everybody was dismissing the Minnesota victory because it was against the New York Giants in the perception of the Giants. Is there a bad football team this year? Which they are. Anytime you've got Daniel Jones as your quarterback, you're going to be a bad football team. But that's another story for another day. Uh, what I'm looking at here is they're going to look at that game. They're going to look at what Minnesota did against the 49ers. And all those people that bashed me last week for taking them, you're crazy for taking them against the 49ers. Well, those same people are going to look at this game and say, well, if they could beat the 49ers getting all of those points last week, and now they're a smaller dog this week to a Houston team that struggled to beat uh, the Bears on Sunday night football, Looks easy to take Minnesota. I'm going to point something out. It's Minnesota that's in the sandwich this week. They're coming off that big win against the 49ers, the statement game. Now they're playing Houston. Uh, look what they got on deck. And this is a non-conference uh, game. Look who's on deck. Their arch rival in the division, the Green Bay Packers. I'm going to go with Houston here. And as far as last week's close call, for Houston, they were in uncharted water. This is a team that hadn't been on Sunday night football in forever. Not only were you asking them to win, you were asking them to win by a margin. That was asking a lot for a team in prime time. 
Now they got the win. They got it in ugly fashion, so to speak. And I love teams in that spot. You're getting line value. Houston has too many offensive weapons. They're not going to come in here fat and sassy, possibly like the 49ers were after the big win over the Jets. The team that's fat and sassy is the home team, Minnesota. We're going against them this week. Take the Houston Texans, lay the small number. I look for them to win by 10 or more. Shout out to Marco for giving me that Vikings pick because I had to sprinkle just a little bit on the money line after I listened to last call on Sunday morning and heard it was going to be a very big need for the Superbook. All right, Joe Ranieri, you are up next. Well, uh, Cal, we are going to uh, head to one of the games in which I'm going to base uh, a few different plays on this week and a couple of different teasers. And it's going to center around the Chicago Bears taking on the Indianapolis uh, Colts. Still one and a half is available out there, so you can certainly use Chicago in any sort of uh, half a leg of any teaser that you are considering. But I like the Bears to win this game outright as well. I mean, listen, nobody is going to confuse these two offenses uh, for being high scoring and high powered in any way, shape or form. Uh, both are dealing with quarterbacks that are having some growing pains. In fact, when you look at Richardson for Indianapolis, there are a handful of passers uh, that have a worse completion percentage going back to last year than Richardson. That would be Taylor Heineke, P.J. Walker, and Dorian Thompson-Robinson. Uh, the reality is Shane Steichen is going to go through it. There's going to be a lot more scratching of the head when it comes to Richardson, who's got all the talent in the world. He's got the arm. He's got everything. He looks like a Hall of Fame quarterback at times. But the problem is, most of the time, he looks like he does not have a clue as to where the ball is going. Hence, the three interceptions last week against Green Bay. That pretty much did them in now we're going to take on a bears defense here guys that are going back uh to last year i don't think this bears defense has given up more than 20 points in any particular game here the defense and the secondary uh have been lights out and when you consider that the quarterbacks that they've actually had to deal with you know cj stroud for instance on sunday night uh richardson's not in that category there's no way is he in that category and caleb williams well the problem with caleb williams is that when he's not blitzed he looked pretty good early on in the first half of that game when he was blitzed and he was blitzed a lot by that pass rush of houston five sacks pressured on 50 percent of his dropbacks uh and things started to fall off the good news is this Indianapolis Colt defense, which, by the way, just got gashed uh, by a quarterback who everyone knew couldn't throw the ball. Everybody knew Green Bay was running, and Green Bay still ran all over this Colts defense. Their best pass rusher, DeForest Buckner, out on IR. This is not a team that is going to get to Caleb Williams in any way, shape, or form. They're also not a team that can stop the run, apparently, even when they know it's coming. So to me, uh, I think there's going to be a lot more head scratching days for Anthony Richardson, Shane Steichen and the Colts. And I think you're going to see that on full display here against this Bears defense. Give me the Bears to win outright. Give me the uh, money. Uh, give me the money line. Give me the points and give me them in teasers as well, Kel, as you look down this board this week. Yeah, Packers, Bears, teasers, both look pretty enticing. I kind of want to do the Vikings teasers. Don't tell Marco. Mm. Anywho, uh, we're going to get to Teddy here because it is time for Teddy's best bet. Sure, sure. We got the Mike McDonald versus Mike McDaniel matchup. Mm. Seattle and Miami. And, of course, the concept here is something I got wrong last week. And I got wrong because I thought that DeForest Buckner was going to be healthy and that Indy was going to be able to stop Green Bay's running game and force the quarterback to do something that was not the case. Nonetheless, conceptually, we talk about Seattle and Miami. We have Miami coming off a really bad loss, and they lost their quarterback. They do have extra time to repair. And the backup, Skyler Thompson, Kelly's old friend from Kansas State, the pride of Kansas State, this isn't a kid. This isn't a rookie. He's 27 years old. 
He's been in the league in recent seasons. And oh, by the way, he won this backup job. He beat Mike White, who was the backup last year and actually got some playing time last year. So the thought process for Miami coming into the season is Skylar Thompson is going to be good enough to win us a game or two if we need him to. And I think that's the case, certainly with extra time to repair. But there's a bigger issue here when it comes to Seattle. All right. Seattle's 2-0. and One win in overtime by three. A very physical game against New England. That's what they're coming off of with the full travel across the country spot after the game. And then one win versus the bad team playing a bad game in Denver. I like they've beaten anybody. Huh. All right. Certainly not beaten a good team thus far. They're fat and happy. And Seattle's not built. They're not a... You know, let's lay more than a field goal off an overtime win facing a team with a backup quarterback. They're not that kind of team. They're banged up already. Kenneth Walker, Sir, Jerome Baker, George Fant, Farrah Brown. And this home field really hasn't been worth much. I know it's a new coach, but 0-1 against the spread as home chalk this year. 2-4 and against the spread as home chalk last year. 1-4 and against the spread as home chalk in 2022. Their last winning season against the spread as home favorites in Seattle was 2020. And I throw everything out from 2020 at this age. I really don't look at any of those stats or numbers. That one year was pretty random. So bottom line, short and sweet, too many points. Give me Miami plus the points in Seattle. Mm. I would have to agree. Skylar Thompson, not that big of a drop off from Tua. While significant, I think that one's a little bit of an overreaction. And here's me not overreacting to my best bet last week. So I'm going to lay seven with, excuse me, six and a half here on the Wager Talk odd screen with the Bucks. I understand exactly why Sharp Money is coming in on the Broncos, but this is no different than why Sharp Money is coming in on the Panthers. You have a Tampa team that just got outgained 463 yards to 216 yards and still won a game in Detroit. I get it. The math guys are going to say, we want nothing to do with Tampa. You know who I want nothing to do with? Denver. Bo Nix threw two more interceptions. That puts him up four on the season, including one in the red zone. Baker Mayfield has been thriving in Tampa over the last two seasons. We know he has a trio of wide receivers that can get to the ball for him. And then here's that Denver offense once again. We have some holes in the Bucks secondary. We know some guys are banged up. Who is going to exploit that on the Denver side of the ball? They are not. Tampa Bay 3-0 in the last two seasons as a non-division home favorite. Let me pull up the gold sheet from this week because they have even a better one. Teams that have started the season 2-0 facing teams that are 0-2 are 33-26. and That is 56% against the spread since 2000. Nothing really to write home about, but if that 2-0 team is at home as a favorite of six or more in week three, that number jumps to 72% against the spread. I'm buying the Bucks here. I'm going to be at the game with my good friend Jeff Petch. You guys know him as the Mad Russian. And I fully believe that the Bucks will beat up on this Denver team by, you know, a margin of, uh, we'll call it 10. We'll call the final score 27-17. I'm laying the number with the Buccaneers. And that is my best bet for NFL Week Three, shout out to all of you guys. Shout out to Marco D'Angelo, Joe Ranieri, Teddy Covers, Andy Lang, Ralph Michaels, and of course, Yanni the Greek. Jump in the comment section. Just don't call Marco an idiot again this week, please, because he is uh, single-handedly making my 0-2 last week not look so bad. He's keeping our numbers healthy. Uh, but again, hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. We'll be here each and every Wednesday for the NFL edition of Bet On It.